on this edition of Great Lakes Now. I go out on the only boat in the country with its own zip code. Look at that, just awesome. We take you aboard a 740-foot Great Lakes freighter, and we dive into some incredible shipwrecks that you don't necessarily need a scuba tank to see. I mean, it's one of the best freshwater collection of shipwrecks anywhere in the world, and people don't know that. Great Lakes Now is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Even Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you, thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome back to Great Lakes Now, where we explore the five lakes and what they mean to our lives. One of the most impressive sights we all see on the lakes are the huge freighters moving cargo. Most of the time we see them, they're way off on the horizon, but today I'm getting the chance to see one right up close. I'm in Detroit on the banks of the Detroit River, and this is the headquarters of the J.W. Westcott Company, home of the country's only floating zip code. Jim Hogan is the owner of the company today, but it's been in his family for generations. So Jim, tell us uh, who we're looking at here on the wall. On the wall is the uh, founder of the company, uh, my great-grandfather, Captain J.W. Westcott. He was born in 1848 and created this company in 1874. Jim's great-grandfather started the business by delivering messages to passing ships in a rowboat. Nearly a century and a half later, letters to Great Lakes freighters get marked 48222 and get delivered on the boat that bears the Westcott name. And today, I get to go along on deliveries. I'm with Captain Bill Redding. He and the crew are picking up mail from a freighter that's getting fueled up on the Detroit River. Okay, we're uh, just gonna be coming alongside the Manitowoc, which is uh, currently tied up at the uh, Mastersky fuel dock. The process is low tech, but effective. A pail is lowered to the Westcott without going mail. If there was mail for the crew of the boat, it would go in the pail and get pulled back up. I'm just amazed to be standing right next to the hull of this enormous freighter. Knock on it. How freaking solid that thing is. Oh yeah, yeah. that thing's like touching it's concrete. That thing, That's... Yeah. I'm already like a wide-eyed kid, but the Manitowoc was docked to fuel up. What the Westcott is known for is making deliveries to freighters that are moving, no matter the conditions. Brian Hakery started with the company only last year, but he's already seen the river get angry. Did a delivery last year, delivered a crew member right off the west got here to a freighter down here, eight foot swells, and you can see how far the, far the bow is out of the water, it was going under. Oh, wow. And uh, we did a crew change with that right on here, and it was like my third or fourth day here. Welcome to the job. It was scared the crap yeah. out of me. But uh, I came back the next day and uh, been here ever since. The Westcott will deliver just about anything the freighters need. They deliver a lot of packages, and they stock some essential supplies that sailors can't do without. They'll even deliver pizzas. Yeah. They'll come down here and they'll order from a pizza joint right down the street and then they'll deliver it to us. We take it, put it in their delivery box and send it right up the side of the ship on a rope. I bet they, uh, the guys love that. Yeah. Before we're back from the Manitowoc, another call comes in for mail. Hey, good afternoon. This is uh, the Victory here, about an hour uh, below your station. Okay, Victory, one hour below. The tugboat Victory will be pushing a barge past in about an hour, and they're wondering if there's anything waiting for them. Okay, yeah, I'll give you a shout back here in just a few minutes, Cap. But there's another run to make before the Victory arrives. Captain Sam Buchanan is making sure all is well in the engine room with the Huron Bell. That's the boat we'll take out to meet the Esta de Gagnés. And this time, we'll make a delivery to a boat that's moving. But this time, we're not delivering mail. This ship needs a pilot. Ships coming into the Great Lakes from overseas have to take on a pilot to navigate. Pilots like Brett Walker are basically captains who specialize in steering through the Great Lakes. I come over and introduce myself to the captain, and then I take over the navigation of the ship. They have their own skills for sure, but they can't be expected to know all the 
the nuance of every waterway. The nuance of every waterway, and that's where we can. So pretty important, especially as you're winding through the river. And well, we're cheap insurance for the public because uh, we ensure that there's going to be no accidents, no groundings, no pollution, and it's at no cost to the government as it's all borne by the shipper. Now we make our approach. The closer we get to the 400-foot Esta de Gagnés, the smaller the 50-foot Huron Bell feels. Captain Sam snugs the Huron Bell right up to the freighter's hull. This is pretty much what I do all day. I run into things. I perform controlled collisions for the JW Westcott Company to the tune of, I've done it about 50,000 times, they figure. Now, they're not all controlled, unfortunately. No damage, you know, just a little bump, you know, to where, you know, you feel it. If you can feel it, I, I kind of grade myself poorly. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's uncontrollable. If you have a really bad weather day, you're going to bounce up and down, and you just can't control that kind of stuff. But, uh, no, I'm... Unfortunately, I've never done any damage or nothing significant. It turns out delivering a pilot is a lot like delivering the mail. But instead of a pail, the crew of the freighter drops down a rope ladder and the pilot climbs up. So we've delivered our pilot up onto the boat here and uh, he's going up to the bridge right now to go get the pilot that we're taking off. So they're doing a little bit of a changeover right here. You almost forget that we're moving right now. I mean, you look at the you look at the freighter, and we're still. And then you look at the water, and we're actually still cruising down the river. That's pretty cool. And watch them go up the ladder as they were underway. I mean, it's a lot more hair raising than my job. Today, things are pretty calm. But can you imagine doing this with six foot waves? I think I'd call in sick. But for these guys, it's just another day at the office. So you guys deliver the mail and the freight. You deliver the pilots. Yep. Do you guys ever see we, anything like a rescue situation? We, we've rescued so many people, I, I really should have kept count. Uh, really? We've rescued quite a few people over the years. And, uh, you know, um, the last, I think, rescue we had was a fella. He jumped in up the river, and all the rescue boats missed him. I don't know, it was nighttime out, so we heard somebody screaming from the river, so we took oh my our God. boat out and got him. So you just caught him like he was just yeah. passing, and you're, yeah. oh, wow. So this is There's no time to rest. The upbound tanker Algo Scotia needs a pilot, so we're making another run. Oh, there, Algo Scotia. Scotia. Hey there, I just wanted to confirm your speed. This is pretty cool. Captain Sam brings the Huron Bell in for another perfect controlled collision, and the pilot climbs aboard safely. Well, they said seven and a half knots, but it seems like we're going faster. But then again, I've never been up next to a freighter flying through the river like this. I'm gonna take some of my own video real quick because this is cool. Look at that, that's so cool. Look at that's just awesome. As the freighter pulls up their ladder, we're passing under the Ambassador Bridge that connects the US and Canada. Yeah, I mean, that's so cool to go under, passing with the freighter, I mean, tied up, not even tied up, just nudged up along the freighter, going under the bridge. I mean, that's a sight you don't get to see very often. It's so cool. But remember the victory, the tugboat that called for mail earlier? Well, it's about to pass by, pushing the barge Maumee. So it's back to the Westcott to deliver their mail. This is really fun. This is awesome. Great job, Tab. Like all sorts of, you know, childhood uh, be, uh, dreams being made right here. Roger that. See you in a few. We're gonna go to the port side fan tail of the tug behind the barge. So we're gonna sneak up, sneak up in behind the barge onto the tug. If this barge looks like a freighter to you, that's because it was a freighter before it was modified to be used as a self-unloading barge, integrated with the tug Victory, which pushes it from behind. Just tell everybody to hang on. This is a harder maneuver than I normally do, and it gets pretty choppy. It might be a tricky maneuver, but Captain Sam makes it look pretty easy. This time, the mail is handed over directly because the tug is a lot shorter than the freighter's hull. In a moment, we're clear, and Captain Sam and the tug exchange a farewell with their horns. So what are you telling each other? Basically, uh, that's a Great Lakes salute, or that's our way of just saying, you know, thank you, see you next time. And we also use it as a safety tool to let him know that I am clear of him and ready to go. And with that, my time with the crew is at an end. 
but I think I'll be back. I can't get enough of this. Well, that was such an incredible experience and something that I've wanted to do since I was a little kid. Having grown up on the river and watching the freighters go by, you don't realize what an integral role a company like J.W. Westcott plays in the shipping on the Great Lakes. It's just incredible to see it in action. In our next story, partner station WPBS in Watertown, New York, takes us on board one of these enormous freighters. We'll get to meet the crew and get a glimpse of what life is like on board. We've all seen them, massive ships navigating through the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway, transporting cargo to various ports such as Thunder Bay, Buffalo, and Montreal. They're huge, majestic, and mysterious. What happens on these ships? What goes on behind the scenes? What is the crew like? In short, what is it like to live and work on one of these freighters? Mikhail, you want to give a scary call, please? Uh, my name is Wilson Walters. I'm captain of the ship, the CSL Wellen, and I've been with CSL for 25 years. I grew up in a little town in uh, Newfoundland, Canada. When you grow up in this town, you either fish or you go away to look for work, and fishing was starting to die, so a lot of the people from my town had come to uh, the Great Lakes and found work and they enjoyed what they were doing, so I thought I would come up and uh, see what it was all about. I think on day one I was sold. I, uh, I got on a ship and went, you know what, I think this is for me. The CSL Welland is a Seaway Max vessel, meaning that it's 740 feet long and 78 feet wide. It's as big as a ship can be and still fit through the locks at the St. Lawrence Seaway. Working on this enormous laker breeds a unique routine and lifestyle all its own. Much of the 15-member crew found themselves drawn away from a typically 9-to-5 job for a career on the water for good pay and something different, although weeks, if not months, away from home can be challenging. We spoke with several crewmen, most who have come from northern Canada, but a few who have traveled as far as the Philippines and a couple of cadets in training to learn about their life on their home away from home. Uh, deck cadets, so we're uh, kind of like apprentice officers. So we try to learn as much as we can every day about basically every operation that happens on the ship. So when we're on deck, we learn as much about uh, general seamanship practices, like using the winches, you know, setting up gangways, accommodation ladders, um, like launching lifeboats, knowing how to use survival crafts. Uh, when we're on the bridge, we learn as much as we can about navigation and using the navigation equipment to its fullest potential. And uh, yeah, we just, we try to learn as much as we can every day. And uh, yeah, there's no limit to how much you can learn on a ship, that's for sure. I usually work about eight to 10 hours a day. Um, and then because I'm a cadet, I have to do some, uh, some homework for my school. So that probably takes up one or two hours of my day. Um, and then I'll probably try to fit in a workout for about an hour a day. And then I'll have two or three hours left kind of either to, for myself, either as free time or to watch a movie or, or just to relax. I started off as a cadet and went to third mate and then second mate for a while and then chief mate for 10 years. Now I'm get to training in and I'm hoping to be captain now later on this fall. You go into different ports and no two ports are exactly the same. You might go back to the same port, but it might not be the same conditions. So every time you load a boat or unload a boat, it's a, basically it's a new experience. Uh, we got access to lots of things. There's a gym, a uh, place you play darts, watch TV, internet. The rooms are nice. Uh, we do have Wi-Fi. I work from 8 to 5 in the engine room. Uh, I get out in the morning, I have breakfast. Go down in the engine room and one of the watch engineers will tell me what I'm going to do during the day. I wake up in the morning and just to know that I'm going to be doing something that I like to do every day. I can remember my first day. Uh, it was pretty much what have I got myself into. It was a big difference from what I did before. Uh, I mean, obviously seeing this massive ship. I start work at 4, 4 a.m. and I finish at 8 a.m. And then I start again at uh, 4 p.m. But on the ship, we say it's 1,600 and finish at 8 p.m. We do security rounds. We sound tanks, make sure there's no water. We clean. We, we maintain ropes. We make sure like everything is secured. 
We assist in what the the dock guys for unloading if they need anything or if they need any hatches open, we open up the hatches, close the hatches. In my downtime, I talk with family, uh, any chance that I could get. My wife, my two kids, my mom, my dad. Uh, I'm the third mate, so I'm the safety officer representative. So I'm in charge of the uh, watching, uh, watch keeping for about eight hours a day, normally about the 812 watch. And normally in my off watch, I'll be doing checks around the boat, like safety wise, like checking the uh, fire extinguishers, fire hoses, like anything safety orientated, I gotta check and make sure it's okay and working. I have an alarm that goes off about seven o'clock and then I normally take about 20 minutes to like get ready and then go head down for about 7.30 to uh, have breakfast. Then I head up to the uh, wheelhouse if we're out on the lake and uh, keep an eye out and just make sure we don't run into anything make, and keep the boat safe as best I can and just get us to our destination safely really so. Uh, generally as a mate, as you're coming in, you're spotting distances for the uh, captain up top. Since uh, we're about 700 plus feet away and he can't see 700 feet away, so you're basically his eyes. So you're spotting from the shoulder, which is about right where we're standing, and you're trying to give him distances he is off the wall, and how close he's getting in, and then as you're going into the lock, you tell him when the bow is approximately at the center line, so then he gets a rough idea how quickly he's coming in, how slowly he's coming in, so he doesn't come in too quick or come in too slow. Like. If you do a job that you love, you don't feel like you're working. I've got 40 years working on ships, and I can't find five days of my life that I said I don't like what I do or don't love what I do. I love my job. I enjoy being out here. I enjoy the time off. I love working with the people that I have on my ship. So for me, it's work, but it's a great job. The sacrifices, by all means, this wasn't easy. This wasn't an easy road for my family. They sacrificed a lot to see me gone a lot and then come home, go to school. My kids, my wife sacrifice immensely. But I always convinced them it was a means to a hen. And that's when I became captain, they seen the means to the ends. They seen that, you know what, it paid off. Now I have lots of time off. Uh, we travel, we do a lot of stuff together. We're a great family. Next time you see a freighter on the Great Lakes or the St. Lawrence Seaway, look beyond its mighty hull carving through the waves. Think of people like Captain Walters and his crew who use their navigational and technical expertise to help carry this multi-billion dollar international industry on their shoulders. But also remember that they may not be too different from you. If you have questions about life aboard a freighter, Great Lakes Now has a way for you to ask them. Go to greatlakesnow.org and tell us what you want to know. We'll select some questions to ask a Great Lakes freighter captain, then we'll report the answers back to you. People have been navigating the waters of the Great Lakes for over 12,000 years, and the lakes have claimed their share of ships. Hundreds of those shipwrecks are preserved within the Great Lakes only national marine sanctuary in Thunder Bay. I guess the thing I love about diving the most is it's just so quiet and peaceful. I mean, it's one of the best freshwater collection of shipwrecks anywhere in the world, and people don't know that. Believe it or not, this is Lake Huron, just off of the coast of Alpena, Michigan, where the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration operates the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Stephanie Gondula is one of the sanctuary's maritime archaeologists. The accessibility is what's really special about the collection of shipwrecks here in Thunder Bay. So we have super deep shipwrecks that are very intact with their masts standing upright 90 feet in the water column. And then we have the very shallow shipwrecks that are accessible to not just scuba divers, you know, paddlers, kayakers, uh, fishermen, snorkelers, sailors can go out and access these shipwrecks and visit these sites, even glass bottom boat viewers. The cold, fresh water of Lake Huron preserves almost 100 identified shipwrecks within the sanctuary's 4,300 square miles. Visitors can see the wrecks on the water and on land at the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center, a museum that's part of the sanctuary. You know, the fact that you have a, a federal resource like that with archaeologists and historians and that kind of knowledge and expertise there, they're teaching us about them. They're teaching us about what our way of life was back then.
A lot of the important work we do is, of course, on land. We do have our 10,000 square foot visitor center where we're at right now, where almost 100,000 people visit every year from all around the world. And we also do many outreach and educational events. Nick Myers works as the captain of a dive boat that goes out to the wrecks. Today, he and some sanctuary staffers are helping students learn about diving and marine archaeology careers. Well, our, our goal today is really allowing these kids to experience weightlessness and breathing underwater. We're in our Science of the Sanctuary class for the high school and we're doing our class for scuba diving and we're learning how to do like underwater archaeology and all of the stuff that's going on like with the NOAA Center. I was saying to somebody the other day, when I'm on this, my mask is always leaking because I can't stop smiling while I'm under, their, under the water watching these kids. I mean, it's, it's just a blast to see them experience this. Most of them, you know, for the first time, even having a mask and fins on their feet. After training in the pool, these students can move on to the nearby sanctuary waters, but they won't need to become expert divers to visit some of the wrecks. Some, like the Nordmere, are barely below the surface. The Nordmere is the most recent shipwreck within sanctuary waters. It ran aground in 1966, and it was in such shallow water that for decades, much of it still stuck up above the, the surface of the water. Today, it has finally collapsed down just, just below the surface, and it is a wonderful snorkeling and scuba diving site. It's over 500 feet long, and it's about 30 plus feet wide, and so there's so much to see. Diver and Toledo Blade videographer, Andy Morrison, has filmed and photographed the Nordmere extensively. You know, you can stand on the back of the boat, you can look down, you can see the engines, you jump in, you're on the engines. A lot of swim throughs and swim arounds and swim overs and unders, and it's just a huge twisted steel playground for, for divers. The, the writing of, of the name on the hull is still visible. Uh, the, the gauges you can still see. So uh, the preservation makes it a really exciting site, even at a shallow depth. The mono handset is an older wreck that's also in shallow water. The mono handset is probably the most visited shipwreck within sanctuary waters. It's an old wreck. It was built in 1872, burned to the waterline in 1907. Now they were a wooden ship and they were carrying coal and in the middle of the night a uh, lantern spilled over in the engine room and of course there was a fire. The Monahansett burned the waterline and, and sits there still today. There's uh, kind of a flattened hull. It's only in about 18 feet of water I think, but the water most of the time is gin clear. Uh, there's a little bit of fish on it. Uh, there's a, a beautiful propeller on it uh, that, that sticks up out of the sand. A lot of people like to take pictures there and video there and everything. Older still, and a more advanced dive, is the E.B. Allen, which went down in 1871 and sits about 100 feet below the surface. As you descend on the wreck, you can see the, the full outline of the ship's hull, beautiful wooden hull, and off the port bow, you can see the collision hole. And it's just big enough, if you have the training, to, to do a swim through and go through that collision hole, and then you're within the the hull of the ship, you're inside the ship, and it's, it's a great sight to just swim the whole length of this, this wooden schooner. It sits upright, it's fairly intact, it, it has that classic looking, you know, freighter bow, uh, wooden freighter bow when you come down on it, and um, that's one thing I think that I, I don't think I'll ever get tired of seeing is when you're descending on a shipwreck and the E.B. Allen's one of those that's sort of like that. It, it stands tall even though it's sitting 100 feet deep you know but you can still see that it's a, a, a proud wreck kind of a special special wreck. One of the key things that I think the sanctuary brought to the preservation of these shipwrecks is, is truly the awareness. I think the people of Alpena are lucky to have um, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary there. But I also think not just them, but the state of Michigan and the whole Great Lakes region is lucky to have NOAA there. So, you know, it's really important that 
Noah has a presence here in the Great Lakes. There are dozens more shipwrecks in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and the staff continues to map and research the wrecks. But there are shipwrecks in all of the Great Lakes, and we may soon have more National Marine Sanctuaries in the waters off of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and New York. The success that we have seen here in Alpena with Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary has, has inspired other communities around the Great Lakes to champion and nominate their communities for National Marine Sanctuary status. And uh, we're really excited to, to be a part of that and to inspire this in other communities across the Great Lakes. That's our show for now. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. Great Lakes Now is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Even Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you, thank you.